Uh, so without further ado, let's get this show on the road. I'm going to hand it over to John and he's going to take it over. Uh, I will be sitting down there and I'll let you know when there's five minutes left. All right. Whoa, that's loud than I thought it was. That's awesome. Um, so as Tim mentioned, I did what may be the silliest thing that a presenter can do, and that is instead of writing slides, I wrote a system to write to present my slides. So uh, <laughs> that's going to be awesome. Um, all right. Can we turn the lights down a little bit, please? OK. All right, cool. So, welcome everyone to the first talk. Hopefully this will go well. Um, so, I'm in the middle of uh, working on a game, and we'll talk about that later on today. Um, we're talking about making Night in the Woods better with open source. Now, I'm an independent game developer, and Night in the Woods is an independent game. And that actually has some specific meaning when it comes to its relationship with open source. We'll talk about that in a bit. So. The introduction slides. Hello. Um, this is, is May. She's the main character of Night in the Woods. And I'm John. I'm not in Night in the Woods. I just helped make it. Um, I'm from a, a game dev company called Secret Lab. We helped out with the development a little bit. Uh, the main game is being made by a group called Infinite Fall. Uh, it's being published as well by Finji. Um, I've written a number of books for O'Reilly, so this is like my cred establishing slide here. Um, we started with a very, our very first game, uh, uh, sorry, our very first book was a book on game dev, which is the dummies book at the top left. Um, our most recent book is the Kerbal Players Guide, which uh, came out um, just before Christmas and is awesome. Go buy it, please, go buy it. Uh, <laughs> so Night in the Woods is an adventure game coming out uh, very, very soon. We're all very terrified, but it's going to be great. Um, and it's about this cat. So May has just dropped out of college. She is 20 years old. She has um, moved back with her parents, and she's attempting to reconnect with her friends. Um, and she's discovered that all of her friends have moved on with their lives, while she herself has not. Um, and home seems really different now, and the leaves are falling, the wind's getting cold, and also there's something in the woods. It's coming out late February, so please buy it. Pre-orders are available right now. It's on Steam. Um, it's going to be great. <laughs> so the game is very much largely about talking to people. So well, uh, <laughs> fine. Um, now, a game that has a lot of dialogue needs a way to manage all that dialogue. We have a problem to deal with. There are many other games like this that deal with a large amount of dialogue, and they manage it in different ways. So let's look at how they manage it. Dialogue in games is typically structured in a tree form like this, where a line is presented to the player, and the player chooses one of a few options. And then uh, based on what that uh, selection was, we run different dialogue. So we call this a dialogue tree. You may have heard of it. Now, What's kind of interesting about these kinds of dialogue systems is they're basically Turing complete programs on their own, depending on how they're managed, which makes development interesting because now you have to debug conversations. And in addition to executing lines, they also receive input from the user in the form of, uh, of the user's choices, as well as storing and reading variable information as well. So they'll record a fact about what the player did or what, or what some other character did. And that will modify the options presented to the player as they play, or modify the game state in different ways as well. So you end up with these massively branching paths of execution. This is a screenshot from the editor that we use for Night in the Woods. We'll come back to this. So we have a lot of complex uh, possibilities here for the dialogue system. They're complicated to write, and they're complicated to manage. There's a few different, well, really, there's two different ways of building them. And the first way is with a visual design tool. So the most popular tool for working with uh, dialogue trees is a tool called ChatMapper. ChatMapper is big and complicated and featureful and awesome, but huge. There's a lot of stuff. Um, another one is Artisy Draft. Um, Artisy Draft, in addition to managing all of your dialogue trees, is also designed to manage all of your game content. It's a game design tool. Um, and in fact, some of Night in the Woods was actually designed using Odyssey Draft because you can map out, like, OK, the, here's a plot point, here's another plot point. But it's so big that we couldn't really 
effectively use of all the dialogue as well. So the other way you can do it is to write a scripting system. So I mean, that's, that's certainly an option available to you. Um, this is a complex task. If you've ever written a compiler, you know this. Um, here's an example of uh, such a scripting system. This is uh, a test that Ron Gilbert, who's best known for games like, uh, like Monkey Island, um, did for his current game, Thimbleweed Park. So you end up writing a parser that uh, is able to interpret a file and uh, present options to the player and maintain state. And you'll notice that the, um, like the, the state my, uh, uh, sorry, Ray first meeting checks to see if talks to sheriff is equal to true. And then we present a bunch of lines. And then we jump to a different section. Then you can see, how, like, if you looked at this long enough, you understand what's going on here. But and this, this is a very like, um, declarative way of declaring your dialogue trees. Um, that's not what we did for Night in the Woods. Instead, we did um, a bigger thing. Um, yeah, <laughs> because writers don't want to have to become programmers. There are many writers who are programmers, and it actually turns out that, that it's a very overlapping skill, but you can't assume that. For Night in the Woods, the, uh, the lead dialogue writer uh, was also the artist. So we didn't have time for him to learn how to become a programmer as well. He's already got two major skills. Um, he also wrote it alongside his wife, Bethany Hockenberry. Uh, who did the main plot, I believe. So, yeah, we don't want to have to make people learn to code because coding sucks. As much as we like to spruik it to all the school kids, coding sucks. It's awful. So, we wrote a tool that lets you code <laughs> called Yarn. Yarn is a tool for writers that lets them program dialogue in a way that doesn't mean they have to know how to code. So, this is not a brand new problem. In fact, uh, there is also a tool called Twine. Have you heard of Twine? Yep, many of you. Twine is good stuff. Twine is used often by beginning game programmers uh, because you don't actually have to know how to code in order to make something really fun and interactive. So it's really, really good. I love Twine. And in fact, we love Twine so much that we ended up using it as the inspiration for the entire dialog system. So it was a really natural fit, uh, uh, applying lessons learned from Twine to Yarn. You can probably see where we got the name from. It was a natural model. So Yarn looks like this. It lets you write dialogue very naturally. Each line of text you can see here is a line of dialogue being displayed uh, in the game. So here's a scene. Uh, it's a conversation between three characters, May, who you can see on screen here, and her two friends, Greg and Angus. Um, this actually takes place during uh, one of the high points of the game. And so we have a lot of stuff that maintains the current state. You can see that down the bottom there after uh, the line, if anyone's going to ruin your nightmare, it really should be you, um, which I just I love that line. Um, so it's a full programming language. We actually wrote a full pass of this. Um, and it is, um, you could probably write the entire game in this. We don't because Jan arrived about halfway through game development. Now. It's also full of stuff that allows you to uh, maintain the state of characters as well. So for example, um, that block of purple text surrounded by chevrons includes in instructions to the game engine to make the player perform the animation and change the direction that they're looking and uh, all, all kinds of stuff. Choices also are a very easy thing to write as well. So uh, by using syntax like this, we're able to just have one little arrow here, the text to, ch uh, to, to show, and then the uh, consequent text that's going to appear after that choice is selected. Now, this is really easy to write. You don't have to learn this big you know, branching tree syntax. You just start writing text. In fact, uh, most of the yarn that, that was included in the game was written by hand and then transcribed. So it was written in this on pen and paper, and then we just you know, copied it in. Now, independent games love using open source for all the obvious reasons. It's available for free. It's really, really good. You know, there's tremendous support most of the time. But it's rarer, I think, to see game developers work with open source. They really only have time to think about their project. They don't want to have to think about putting stuff out there and maintaining that as well. Because they're already freaking out about one of the most picky types of users on the planet, and that is gamers. They don't want to have to think about devs as well. Now, it's a fairly common pattern that when a game is no longer commercially viable, it gets released for free as open source. 
you know, the sale's not really worth the, the effort of keeping the storefront up, so they'll just stick it on GitHub or somewhere. Um, id is really good at this, so id, open source, Quake, Quake 2, Quake 3, et cetera, um, and put it all onto the GPL. Um, typically, you don't see them open source their assets, they will open source their engine, but, you know, that's fine. Um, and in fact, uh, a fairly recent game that is up for an IGF award, which is um, uh, Quadrilateral Cowboy, uh, uses the, uh, it's either the Quake 3 engine or the, or the Doom 3 engine, um, and, or even the Quake 4 engine. And uh, they actually use it, and it's a fully commercial game. It's making a lot of money, I hope, um, and uh, it's up for a number of awards. So it isn't just you know, open source games, like, that is games that begin their lives as an open source project. It's actually full commercial, like professional games that are using these open source engines and complying with the GPL as well. Now, non-games tend to get open sourced right away. This is because non-games don't have a shipping date. So Facebook is open sourcing stuff all the time. Google is open sourcing stuff all the time because Facebook and Google will never be done. Business considerations notwithstanding. So we tend to see a lot more stuff getting open sourced during production for non-games. And that's really awesome because the community can come in and help out. And this is a thing that Night in the Woods decided to try and you know, get their hands in. Because Night in the Woods released Yarn during development Stick it up on GitHub. And um, primarily, this was, a, this was not done with the intent of getting support from the community. That was more simply, why not? It was very, very much a whim thing. But it worked in terms of uh, community uh, contribution. Because several games ended up using Yarn, so in the same way that other independent games will uh, consume open source stuff. Um, so this includes uh, Far From Noise by George Batchelor, which is a game in development and uh, is coming out very, very soon. It's about a person in a car talking to a deer. Um, <laughs> uh, Sunflower by uh, Arlene Mary Haloka, Karen Texiera, and uh, Alec Haloka, which is a small demo that was designed to uh, say, like, okay, can we use this dialogue tool for creating interactive chooser and adventures? And it worked fairly well, actually. It's really pretty. Um, Knights and Bikes is a fairly large Kickstarter project um, that's using Yarn for all of its dialogue, and uh, yeah, we're really excited about that because it's it's like a very very large, very very uh, experienced team doing it. So we'll be interested to see what they do with it. So I saw Yarn uh, arrive on GitHub, and I got very excited, and I got very very keen on possibly improving it. So I built Yarn Spinner, which is basically a, like a version two of the Yarn compiler. Uh, it was a system designed to work identically to the existing Yarn system, but better. Um, and uh, it actually worked so well that the Night in the Woods dev team reached out to me saying, hey, can we use this instead of our existing stuff? And I said, of course you can. And so the whole thing built from there, and that's why I'm on stage wearing this T-shirt. <laughs> so when I was building this, I made sure to use the same techniques for promotion as game developers use. That is, frequent screenshots and enthusiasm, even if the, those screenshots are just plain text. So running around the internet and yelling about what you're working on is the most important thing, because without that, no one's going to know about it. Now, this is fairly obvious stuff. I mean, it's marketing 101. Unless people know about it, they won't buy it, or in this case, use it. But if you look at how indie game developers do this, it is the most unrestrained burst of enthusiasm every single time they start thinking about their game. Even if it's a little bit forced, it gets people excited. It's not enough to be able to say, OK, I've made my open source project. It's here. It's available, I guess, maybe. Like, run around and yell at people saying, this is the best thing ever. So yeah, this kind of stuff, like make, make something that has some kind of visibility. Even if it isn't going to be necessarily appropriate to your project, use the power of screenshots. And eventually, this kind of thing started happening. <laughs> <laughs> now, a thing that uh, is really worth knowing, we need to do a much, much better job of educating developers who are not active in the open source development world about different licenses. Unless they are a very experienced software developer who you know, has been in the industry for a long time, they will not know the difference between BSD and MIT. In fact, they'll go, BSD and MIT, those are letter groups that mean that I get to use it. GPL means I shouldn't. 
and they won't really know why in many cases. And so we need to do a much better job of educating this. Um, Chooseolicense.com is a really good example of this. Um, but to give you an example, when Yarn first hit GitHub, it didn't have a license. And yes, I see people wincing. Um, and that was sorted out, um, but yeah, people need to realize that uh, it's not enough to be able to you know, stick stuff up on GitHub. So copyright is really important to game developers, but it's not in the same way as open source folks see it. Because really, people tend to share stuff between each other as friends or via an asset store, it's much more rarely that you'll see it appearing on uh, an open source repository like GitHub or Bitbucket. So really there's three things that I want you to take away from all this. Game developers will do the weirdest stuff with your work because they are creative people, they're making something brand new. It will dynamically increase the range of your contributors. You'll get all kinds of amazing stuff came back to you, as well as stuff that you can point to saying, look at this awesome thing someone did with my thing. It also, it, it's a standard thing. It makes your software better. This is the reason why we open source stuff in the first place. So with that, I am uh, available for questions, and I, I hope you enjoy it. Oh, and also this whole thing was in engine, so let's go over here. <laughs> yeah. yeah, thank you. Yes, Paul. Hi, John. This is more of a personal statement than a question. Uh, no, <laughs> 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 no um, this is amazing slide presentation software you have. Um, can I download that from GitHub or torrent it from somewhere? <laughs> so I hopefully plan on releasing the presentation component of this on GitHub. It was embedded inside the Unity game engine, which is not open source, but if you are a Unity developer, then you'll be able to download the stuff that runs this slideshow system. Thank you. Any other questions for John? Or Not yet. We've got, we've got a couple of minutes. John said just slightly earlier. So. Yeah. So, sorry, you just said that was, this is in Unity? This is Unity, yes. And so the plugin is in Unity as well? The when you say so plugin. So Yarn is part of, you have a plugin for Yarn for Unity? Yes, I do. So Yarn is actually not built into Unity. Yarn, <coughs> excuse me, uh, Yarn is a separate thing and will work independently of Unity. There is also a plugin that will bridge between Yarn and Unity. So if you don't want to use Unity, you can also use Yarn Spinner and it's all fine. No, that's good because I want to use Unity. <laughs> cool. I think we had a question here. So you mentioned that uh, Twine played a role in inspiring my, uh, Yarn. Sorry. <laughs> um, how much like sort of active research did you do? What were you? How are you going about identifying the functional requirements for Yarn? And were you drawing upon any other inspirations as well? So my part of this arrived after the Yarn language was actually being used in the game already. So I wasn't part of the decision-making process that led to uh, this syntax being used. That said. The Twine syntax, which was designed for non-programmers, lent, lent itself very, very well towards people who needed to be contributing stuff to the game but didn't want to have to learn uh, complicated syntax. So Twine being a not complicated syntax meant that you know we could get up to speed very quickly. Um, yeah, when I basically arrived, I went, okay, cool. This is let's, uh, this is an existing language. Let's um, uh, formally analyze the grammar and build the parser around that. Um, so, yeah. <laughs>